Hey, what's up, everybody? Chef Eduardo Garcia here in Southwest Montana in my spiritual, my soulful, my culinary home. This is where I'm from. I'm so psyched for everybody joining me and headed here. If you have friends that you think need to be here, now's a really good time to text them and say, yo, head over to the Traeger YouTube channel. Chef Eduardo's about to cook it up. So here we go. Psyched about this today. It's um, summertime, kind of late summer, beginning early fall. And uh, we're gonna do a dish that I think marries late summer and fall beautifully together. But first off, for those who I haven't met yet, um, I'm a classically trained chef. I grew up here in Southwest Montana, flipping burgers, throwing pizzas, and um, just working my way through high school. Had to, ha had to get that money to buy those flyers and buy that backpack and that climbing gear as a young outdoorsman. Then I went to culinary school, graduated, and then spent the next decade traveling the United States, traveling the Mediterranean, the Caribbean, the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Um, didn't make it around the world, but pretty dang close in about a decade. And, you know, if I learned anything by cooking for, you know, the, the luxurious, you know, elite that, that own yachts, uh, I learned that no matter who you are, no matter where you are, and no matter what you're into, food is, it's paramount. It's elemental and it is primal to who we are. So what I love about these scenarios, these, these, whether it's a live demo like what we're doing now or simply just cooking with others, whether you're in a home with somebody or you're out at a trailhead, cooking brings people together. It's what we're all here to do today. So this is what I love to do. 23, 24 years in, um, after 10 years of yachting, I left that career and started a company called Montana Mex. So today, Montana Mex is a organic, natural foods condiment brand. We make sauces and extra virgin avocado oil. We have three different seasoning blends. We're gonna tuck into some of these today, um, but really the core of Montana Mex is to say, hey, we love to cook. We believe it inspires others to live better lives when you're eating great food. So it is just our pleasure and it is an absolute honor to be with Traeger today and with all of you and sort of bringing all of these kind of these beliefs together to say, let's just cook some food, let's have some fun. Um, and these are really like the testaments that I've based my entire career off of. What I always found is no matter where you were in the world, whether the boat was bouncing, whether it was in a hurricane, whether it was smooth, flat seas, breakfast, lunch, dinner always had to occur. So the great equalizer, grub. So today, oh, and I know, I know that some may ask, you say, hey, Look at that chef, he's got a hook for a hand, so I just get the elephant out of the room too. I had an electrical injury 10 years ago now that took off my left hand. And you know, if anything, we all get to benefit by this a little bit because it kind of dropped my ego down, it made me a humbler man, and it also took sort of my highfalutin, finessed culinary ways from you know the exclusive yachting sector. And you know, I was dropping food, I couldn't actually get quite sort of detailed in my knife work anymore. Certain things were harder. And so it actually just kind of brought me back down to my roots to say, look, I love really good, simple, honest grub. And so today, that's what we're gonna focus on. Not only that, we're gonna go to a protein. We're gonna use organic chicken today. And we are going to do a spatchcocked bird. Now, for anyone who doesn't know what the term spatchcocking refers to, I'll show you when we get into it, but it's basically a butterfly bird. We're gonna marinate it with some cumin, some garlic, some coriander, some oregano, some red chili, some lime, some lime zest, some avocado oil. I'm gonna rub a bird completely. I've kinda got one going right here, so we'll get to peek at it here in a minute. And it'll be a chili lime bird, spatchcocked, so it's butterflied. We're gonna cook it at 400 degrees. Got some hickory pellets in here right now. Listen, you can, cook chicken on almost any pellet you'd like, and Traeger makes a terrific array of hardwood pellets and blends. I like the smell of hickory. I love its pairing with, with uh, chicken. I love the chili lime chicken as well, and when I prepped this out a week ago and tried this prior to this demo, I thought it was terrific. There's other pellets and other woods you can use, but today we're gonna go with hickory. The bird aside, we're also gonna take some summer fruits, like nectarines, peaches, and we're gonna throw a seasoned sweet blend that Montana Mex makes on them. I'm gonna grill those. I think a late summer pairing when those stone fruits are just cranking with flavor. Such a great pairing, these smoked chicken and grilled stone fruits. 
So we'll do that dish. And I pulled that off the Traeger website. That's actually a dessert recipe. It's really beautiful. It's grilled stone fruits. They use apricots, nectarines, and peaches. They grill them for about three to four minutes and pair it with a whipped cream, a honey whipped cream, and a reduced balsamic that has some orange peel and whatnot. So we're gonna kind of like pull from that and marry it into our bird dish. And then thirdly, we're also going to bust out the whistle pig rye because hey, it's five o'clock in lots of places right now, including right here mountain time. And we're gonna do, it's almost like a whiskey sour, but it has a little egg in there, it has a little smoked pecan and rosemary. You know, I met the Whiskey Pig Distillery crew a year and a half ago, and I was just blown away by the distillery when I saw this recipe on the Traeger um, cocktail sort of menu that they have on their website. I was like, yep, I'm going with that whiskey sour. So we're also gonna do a cocktail today too. So I guess we should get going. Let's get started. First things first. And please, I should say, while we're cooking, while we're jamming, Hit me up with questions. I want to know what you're thinking. Love to know what you got on your brain. And, uh, and then we get to cook together too. So, but we're going to start out. We got a little bowl right here. A little spoon to mix. And we're going to make, this is going to be our wet marinade. Pull our ingredients out. We're going to need our avocado oil. We're going to need a couple of limes. We're going to need some garlic. And I tell you, for most folks, a wet, a wet marinade is a beautiful thing to, a beautiful method to get a ton of flavor into whatever you're cooking. And I know that you'll see a recipe and it says, look, if you don't have 24 hours, you can use it right away. That is true. I also would think, like to say that if you have the time and you can knock this out ahead of time, it can not take you long. We're gonna do it right here and marinating your bird, marinating chicken ahead of time, and really any meat is gonna really help the flavors get deeply embedded into whatever you're cooking. And not only that, but the longer that the dry spices and seasonings that you're using, so such as the red chili and this Montana Mex blend, it's gonna be our, it's gonna be our cumin. The longer these dry, ingredients can sit in a wet liquid. There's, in the, in the culinary world, we call it the bloom. And so you gotta think of all of the, that lime, the moisture, is breaking apart those dry cell walls and opening back up and letting the aromas, letting the flavors and any essential oils that are in there come back to life. So that's what that bloom is. So if you have time, let your marinade bloom overnight. Let it open up. Just gonna get more bang for your buck. Okay, so have our mixing bowl. Have some spices ready, some seasonings ready. I'm gonna mash up this garlic, just get it roughly chopped. What's the temperature out today? So we have our girl, thank you, Isabel. We got Isabel at Team Montana Mex taking all of your questions, so make sure to feed her, and then I'll get those questions and I'd love to answer them. Our temperature is at 400. I like cooking, I like cooking my chickens at high heat. I feel like I get a crispier skin. This chicken really, it's gonna take anywhere from 50 to 60 minutes, and we're going for a temperature of 160. Fully cooked chicken, most folks are gonna recommend 165, but I'm gonna pull the bird a little early I don't want it to overcook. Do you recommend going organic all the time when it comes to chicken? Do I recommend going with organic when it comes to chicken? You know, I um, I had to come to terms with this a while back, but I do. I recommend um, organic foods in the produce world and uh, in the dairy and the meat world. You know, I, uh, gosh, I think it goes back it goes back years prior to my injury, but it was really when I had my injury and I was in the ICU and I was on a ton of medication, I just recall wanting to get off that medication as early as I could, as soon as possible. And 
you know, I've always been into eating healthy foods. I've always been into additive free foods. I mean, that's the core of what our company was built on. It was just preservative and additive free. However, it wasn't until my injury where I really started to pay attention to the medicines I was taking because I was in recovery. And I kind of have carried that into my life right now. So when possible, I would like to purchase a bird or purchase meats, dairies, and vegetables that are as pure as possible. That's just my stance. I mean, heck, I took on gardening and my wife Becca and I have a fairly decent sized permaculture farm on our property here in Montana. And it kind of is my way of getting to know what organic foods are from the ground up. Um, and then also a way of just ensuring that, you know, that our food is uh, as clean and pure as possible. Okay, so we got our rough garlic, roughly chopped, microplane zester. I highly recommend that anyone watching put one of these in your kitchen kit. They're not expensive and they're terrific tools for removing the exterior of things like citrus fruit. You could take a cinnamon stick or nutmeg and grind it. Just a terrific high quality grater. It's called a microplane. We're gonna grate these limes into our marinade. You see the lime zest is packed with flavor, packed with oils, and gosh, it'd just be a waste, wouldn't it, to cut this and pitch it with all that goodness on the outside? So. I would highly recommend for any of your dishes really that are using citrus, whether you're making a vinaigrette, you're making a cocktail, try, uh, try zesting some, some citrus in there and see if you notice the flavor. Oh, hi, baby girl. I'm saying baby girl, not to you, but to my dog. So in case she comes strolling in here, I'm just giving everyone a heads up that my pup is on the lookout. She smells what's in this Traeger right now. You can, yeah. So, great question. Thanks for asking. Um, you go to montanamex.com and we do sell our trio of seasonings. You can find them there. And I highly recommend get into the backstory, go through those other pages too. I'm not trying to turn you away from the product, but I also, um, you know, I always say that we're, we are a company of heart driven individuals and we're here for all of you. We're here to make your heart sing. And so when I get a chance to sort of share our why with everybody, uh, I have to take advantage of it. So please go flip through and familiarize yourself and get to know our family. Okay, got our lime zest going in. This is looking good, smelling awesome. Next step up is I'm gonna juice the limes and then we're gonna add our dry ingredients Just wanted to make a note. Oh. Gang, I'm gonna pull an audible because I noticed that our chicken is up to temp. So I wanna pull this out right now. I'm not quite done with our marinade to get another bird on, which I'll show you, but I don't want this chicken to overcook. So I'm gonna follow the lens. We're gonna come over here to the grill. I'm gonna pull this bird off. You know, it's probably because it's summertime in Montana. And it's an interesting thing to consider when you're cooking at home, but carryover cooking and cooking times are 100% gonna be affected by the ambient temperature. I'd say it's probably 90 degrees outside, 85 in the shade. And so this bird seems to be cooking a little faster than normal. So now I don't know if everyone can see, but there's the, Temperature probe is stuck right into the thickest part of the thigh, not touching the bone, but just into the meat. And the reason that is, is the dark meat takes longer to cook than the white meat. I wanna make sure that that dark meat really comes up to temp. So, I'm gonna take that probe and I'm gonna leave it here because I'm gonna be using that momentarily for the other bird that we put in here. This is looking beautiful though. Before I pull it though, you know, you can trust your electronics, but I want to give it just one more test just to make sure that I wasn't misreading it. So we're going to take the probe, we're going to throw it right into the thigh meat. 
just like that. Yep, yeah, our temperature is good. So, again, you want to take that bird all the way up to about 160. I'm going to keep this bird right here. Now, I'll close the lid and let the temperature come back to 400 for the chicken that we are about to put on once we get it marinated. But while this chicken sits, pretty key is letting this chicken now rest. What happens is when you're letting it rest, you're letting all the juices that run to the interior, the cold part of the chicken, when the heat is attacking the outside of the bird, and you're giving the meat time, you're giving all that protein time to relax on the outside and let the moisture go from the center back out to the far sides so that it's evenly distributed. So you get a nice moist bite everywhere you are on the chicken. So I'm gonna take a couple sheets of foil and we're just gonna tent this chicken loosely. What it's gonna do, it's gonna just keep that nice ambient temperature and we'll let that rest while we finish our demo out here. Dang, I, thanks for hanging with me, everybody. I feel like I threw you for a loop. All right, let's get back into this. We have our garlic, our lime zest. We're doing our wet marinade for a chili lime spatchcock chicken. What kind of knife are you using? This is a custom blade out of my friend Tyler Dooley down in Wilson, Wyoming made this and gave it to my wife Becca and I as a wedding gift. And then I have a shun as a slicer. So I'm gonna use our juicer. Sometimes I can use my hook as an auger to get all that citrus out, but these guys were a little tough, so I'm gonna use this press. We are in the southwest part of Montana right now, uh, near the Bozeman area. Okay. So we got our lime juice, our garlic, our lime zest. I'm gonna go with our cinnamon. Go about that, a teaspoon of cinnamon. Got our dried ground cumin. Nope, that's our coriander. So this is dried cracked coriander. Let me throw that in, About a teaspoon of that as well. This is our cumin. Yeah, unmistakable flavor. Chile lime cumin is such a beautiful marriage. Does awesome on pork, definitely does great on chicken, which is what we're doing today. There goes our cumin. Throw some coriander or some oregano in here. And then because this is a chili lime, we're gonna use the Montana Max red chili seasoning, which is right here. The chili seasoning has four different types of chiles. It has Guajillo, it has Ancho, it has Pasilla, and New Mexico. Each one of these chili blends lends a different flavor, a slightly different color, and so I took, let's see, I made this five years ago, I made this bench top recipe. We're actually gonna go with three tablespoons. We're gonna crank on this. There we go, one, two, three. I remember making this and thinking to myself that I wanted a chili blend that did not just have sort of that ubiquitous deep red chili flavor color, but I wanted to add chiles that all contributed a certain different nuance. So the Guajillo chili, for example, is gonna be a sweeter chili. The Ancho chili is gonna naturally be a little smokier, a little deeper. And the Pasilla is gonna add just a touch of spice, even though I believe it's a, it's a mild blend. Okay. So this is what our paste looks like. We're gonna add 
some avocado oil. This is an extra virgin avocado, avocado oil cold press. So terrific for your body, terrific for your skin, packed with omega-3, 5, and 6 fatty acids. And this is our wet marinade, beautifully come together. Okay, marinade done. Next step is I wanna show everyone how to break down a spatch cocked chicken. Here we go. So that's our organic chicken. I'm gonna pull a new cutting board out just to keep our board nice and clean. Oh, by my guess, this is probably a four pounder. I'd put money on that. I didn't see the label, so that is an honest guess, but I think it's about a three or four pounder. I know the recipe calls for three or four pound birds. So with poultry, when we're using poultry, I wanna make sure that smells good, smells nice and clean, smells fresh. Um, I wanna make sure that there's no funky discoloration or blemishes. So we're gonna give our bird a good look. And you know, it's, this is our food. We gotta play with it. We should hang out with it. We should know what we're eating, how it's built. So we're giving it a once over. This chicken looks terrific. And so I'm gonna take my Traeger shears. Now for spatchcocking, you can see that the spine, this is its tail, and this is where the neck comes out of the cavity of the body. And what we're gonna to do to spatchcock a bird is effectively we're just gonna open it up and butterfly it. So I'm gonna take these shears and I'm gonna start right here on the side of the neck and I'm gonna follow it all the way on the, this side. So I'm gonna stay on one side and then I'll do the other. We're just gonna remove the spine completely. I would highly recommend that if you are gonna spatchcock your bird that save, save these shears or not, sorry, not the shears, but save the spine. You can use that for a stock later. Sometimes if I get to a tough spot, then especially right around the hip joint right here, sometimes have to get your shears and kind of noodle them in and out of there, right? Because you got that hip bone in the thigh that this is a socket. This is the hip joint. And you got to get the shears kind of in and out of there. So there we go. Do the other side. Okay, so yeah, so I'm gonna save this backbone. Awesome for stock, don't throw this away. Okay, look at this beautiful bird. So we got our spatchcocked chicken. And now you can see that it still wants to stand upright. This is a little bit of a brutal task, but I know everyone can do it here because we're all foodies and we should be playing with our food. We should know it. So the sternum, which runs right here through the middle of the breast and the chest, uh, needs to be broken. In that way, the breast is going to lay flat. So the way I do it, I'm about 160, dripping wet, but I'm going to take my palm my hand and put it right in the center of the breast, just like that. And I'm going to lean down with my weight. And what you're hoping to do is you're hoping to pop that sternum bone, okay? If you can't get it, you gotta be pretty pretty robust with it. Sometimes, if I need to, I'm gonna take a knife and I'm gonna score right here. You can see the cartilage coming off that sternum bone. So I'll take a knife and you don't have to use a mallet like I have right here. You can use the back of another knife, but I like to just give it a little pound. You can see how it opens up like that. So if you're having trouble breaking that sternum bone, that's just my tip or trick, is that you can flip the bird over and take the heel of your knife, which is right here, and just with a little pressure, it's gonna open right up for you. So, now that we have our bird spatchcocked, another move I'd like to show everybody that I think is just tremendous to do and well worth the time and energy is to get between the skin and the muscle. So, again, Let's play with our food. Let's get dirty and messy with it because there's no better way to get to know what you're eating than to get to know it, if you know what I mean. So we got releasing the skin from the breast. We're moving over here to the other one. There we go. I'm certain there's a way to remove the skin from the wing bones. 
I've never had the patience or successfully done that. If anyone out there has got a tip, I'm certain someone's going to hit us up and say, I used an air compressor. But for now, I'm just getting what I can with my hand. And I want to be careful to not tear that skin, right? I really want to keep that intact. There we go, opening it up. And so now from here, we're going to take our wet marinade. And what we're going to do is we're going to start by taking a few spoonfuls and getting it right inside the cavity, just like this, under the skin. We're about to get beautifully messy with this whole operation. What are the advantages of using avocado oil versus olive oil? You know, the, well, the advantages of using avocado oil versus olive oil are that you have the flavors of the avocado in play, which I think are beautiful. It also has a higher smoking point than olive oil. And smoking point essentially is that place where with a lubricant or a fat, you're gonna heat it up to such a point that will start burning off all those trace nutrients. And avocado oil, out of all of the high nutrient oils out there, has the highest burning point, upwards of 440 degrees. So what it means is you can get a nice crispy egg fried, you can use it in cooking like this. We're at 400 degrees right now, and we're not going to burn off all those nutrients that basically you just purchased in that beautiful avocado oil. But they're going to stay with the food so that it goes right here when you're eating it. Okay, so we have the marinade under the skin. Now we're going to come on top and just make sure we get all over the outside. We'll flip it over. We're going to do both sides. And then at this point, we would let this sit overnight. I remember, I'm gonna tell everyone a story while I'm finishing this chicken. It was a family Thanksgiving, gosh, it must have been 12 years ago now, and we were at an Airbnb. I think there was like 35, you know, extended family there, so we had to rent a home. Our home wasn't big enough. And when you're, you know, when you're a chef and you're in a family that loves to cook like the Garcias, naturally you throw your apron on, you tuck in, and you get involved. Well, in Montana, Thanksgiving also lands right in the middle of hunting season. And so it's kind of, that's a tough one for me because not only do I want to help and be a part of dinner and cooking, I also want to be out in the field hunting. So I usually try to do both, which is a classic Eduardo move, doing a little bit more than you can handle. And, um, and I remember getting back to the house at, I mean, let's say dinner was at five and I roll back by two three hours before dinner. I figured that was ample time, ample time to like maybe help with a little of this or help with a little of that. And I remember showing up two o'clock, dinner at five, no turkey in the oven, still sitting in a bag in the fridge, cold as a bone with kind of, no one really concerned, but just no, per, no bird in the oven. And for anyone who's in charge of cooking the turkey for your family on Thanksgiving, you're probably sweating bullets, right? Yeah, well, I kind of was too. I walked in and said, oh man, all right, what time do we want to eat? Five, we have three hours? So we spatchcocked those turkeys. We opened oh, two of them, cranked the oven to 500, 450, all the way up, cracked them in half, just like this chicken is right here, threw them on sheet pans, and dropped them into the oven, rotated top to bottom, top to bottom. And I think the way that it worked was about 40 minutes at high heat, and those turkeys were beautifully brown on the outside. Like I'm talking like gorgeous brown on the outside. And not quite done on the inside, but you know, brown enough that we didn't want them to have too much more color. So I think we dropped the heat down at that point to about 350. And by that three hour mark, those turkeys had rested. They were juicy, they were brown, they were beautiful. And Chef Ranga Pereira, if you're watching this, I know you remember that. My sister Indra, if you're watching this, I know you'll remember that because both of you were next to me when we looked at our scenario and said, yeah, I don't know how we're gonna do this. And I said, all right, let's crank this oven to 400 and 4, 450. Let's spatchcock those turkeys and let's do it. So that's another great benefit to spatchcocking is you're gonna get 
uh, quicker cooking time, quicker cooking time, and uh, and also the way that we're going to put this bird on. So we're going to put this chicken on bone side down, and um, and the skin on the outside is going to get beautifully crispy. So sometimes when you have a bird that's roasted or trussed, you're going to have elements of the bird that maybe is sitting in oil or sitting in its juices, and they're not going to crisp up as much. So. In this scenario, you're gonna take the chicken. I like to use just a non-reactive baking dish. So what I did with the bird that we marinated, is I'll just close it up like that, put it in a dish, cover it, let this sit overnight. Again, 24 hours, if even longer, not too bad, but if you can go all the way up to a full day long sit, you wanna do that. Keep it in the fridge, it's gonna be just fine cover it. So now I want to show everyone, apply this out. This is the chicken that I marinated yesterday. And so when you're going for a 24 hour marinade, what happens is all of those fresh spices that we just mixed you can see sort of the color difference, super vibrant red, a little bit more muted. But this bird is also ready to go on. And so we're gonna put this chicken on just so that we can have something cooking in the background because we already pulled that other one. But yeah, you can see that the colors are also penetrating into the skin, which I think is just great. It's gonna add to the color and it's also gonna add to the finished flavor. Okay. Give my hands a quick wipe. Bring your chicken over. So now when you're laying your spatchcock bird down, we're gonna to wanna to go bone down, skin up, okay? Just like that. And now for getting that meat probe and that thermometer in there. Again, we wanna take it and we wanna go into the thickest part of the thigh. So we wanna go and not touching the bone, but right into this meaty part of the thigh. We're gonna go just like that. There we go. And so now we're gonna let that bird do its thing and close the lid on it. We'll check it momentarily. It's gonna be about 50 to 60 minutes, again, depending. But I always say, if you can have a meat thermometer or a meat probe on there, monitor it. You wanna pull that off at 160. Isabel, what was that question? I don't think the recipe is all that spicy. I also have a deep affinity for spice. So when trying to be objective, I would say if Tabasco is somewhere in the world of maybe a five out of 10, I'd say this recipe is gonna be a three. Would you recommend frying? You know, I think there, uh, that's a great question. So would I recommend brining this dish before marinating? I think it's almost one and the same. So the salt, brining is a technique where you're using sort of a salty solution and you're soaking prior to cooking and allowing all that salt to pull the moisture out of the product, the chicken that you're using, and to go inside and allowing that salty brine to go in. I think that the wet marinade has enough salt in it that it's gonna get more than enough salt content in there. Right, so our bird is in. We have our other one resting. That was early, caught us on the fly. And so I think next up, let's get our fruits prepared. So we have some summer peaches, some summer nectarines. These look good. I was hoping for apricots because I love apricots, but I couldn't find any. So we're gonna go with these. a dish over and we're going to use our Montana Mex sweet seasoning for these suckers. And we're just going to take them 
and we're going to slice them in half. This is one of the hardest moves for me right now as an amputee chef, I'll tell you, is cutting avocados and anything with a pit. Cut around, try to take those two lobes and twist them. We'll see how I do, but I don't want anyone judging me, okay? There we go. Thanks for the questions, by the way. It feels like I'm in an actual hangout and conversation. You're here in the yard with me, so please keep them coming. Well, there's hickory pellets that are currently in this Ironwood 885, it's set at 400 degrees. All right, let's see if we can do this. Y'all taking bets over there? I'm gonna put my hook on the outside. I'm gonna twist. Oh, not bad. Let's see how we do. Oh, trying. Trying, there it goes. <laughs> beautiful, amazing, awesome spirit animal, wherever she went. She, uh, actually my mother-in-law, which is fun to say, I'm a year into marriage. Um, oh, I mangled this one, sorry guy. Um, got me a DNA test for our puppy. And as it turns out, our dog is, I think a pretty heavy blend of Staffy or Staffordshire Terrier. Um, what was the other part in there? We always thought it was Collie Pitbull, but there's not much of that in there at all in her. So I'm having a moment here. I'm actually going to ask for some off-screen help and see if Isabel can help me pull the lobes off these nectarines. Thank you. And if not, I'm just going to keep going with these peaches. Tell you, losing your hand teaches you a lot of things. One of the most primary is ask for help. I don't mind trying, but I do like do like to do the recipe, and I do want to see those nectarines grilled. Thanks, Isabel. You nailed those. Appreciate it. Here we go. That one went. Yeah, let's try this out too. Hmm. For any of you that live down in parts of the world where peaches and nectarines grow, I envy you. I love stone fruits and we just simply don't get them up here in Montana. So here we go. We've got those nice and halved. I think I'm going to struggle getting those pits out, so I'll save those. But what we're going to do is we're going to take the Montana Mex Sweet Seasoning. This blend is a beautiful mix, one of the funnest mixes I got to make out of the three that we have. It has orange peel, has cinnamon, has aji amarillo chile, ginger, allspice, a little bit of clove, sea salt. I'm going to give ourselves just a little dunking tray. I'm going to take our peaches. I'm going to give them just a, just a face dunk, just like that, and our nectarines. And then we're going to grill these for just about five or so minutes, five to six minutes, we'll see. I'd like, especially when I'm serving them with a the grilled meat, I don't want them to be, well, either you wanna cook them all the way so that they're maybe a relish or a compote or fully cooked and breaking down, and that would be actually beautiful. I mean, you could grill these fruits until they're soft enough that you could almost mash it. Think about your pork chops or pork dishes with an applesauce, right? But in this case, I want there to be just a little bite to these fruits. So we're not going to cook them too long. I'm going to try to go with one more. Let's see. There we go. Okay. So and those fruits, I'm going to go right on the grill check on our bird that's in here doing its thing. All right, like what I'm seeing. So we're gonna come over here again, it's at 500 degrees, so they're gonna cook quick, keep my eye on them. 
I'm just gonna go face down just like that. And not only will the natural and the sugar from the spice blend caramelize on the fruits, but they should pick up with just a touch of smoke. Okay. I'm gonna have to make something fun out of these other ones once I get another hand in here to remove the pits. Mm-hmm. Okay, so before we get into our bird and plating this dish, I think it's time to make ourselves a cocktail. Sun is dropping a little bit. This is not a cocktail, this is just H2O. All right, farm stock, whistle pig, rye, Angostura bitters. What else do we need? We need a cocktail shaker. Heck yeah, psyched on this. Cast iron pan, we'll explain this in a second. You'll know exactly what we're up to. And then we have our Traeger smoked simple syrup, which is really beautiful. I tried it earlier, it has just a hint. I think it's loaded with honey, vanilla, clove, nutmeg. Simple syrup is really, it's equal parts sugar, water. You can also make a simple syrup with honey. And of course, just as the fine folks at Traeger have done, you can infuse it with thing, with spices as well. Okay, so before we get cracking into this though, I'm gonna take a touch of this rosemary. I'm actually gonna get it wet first. Go. And we're going to end up taking pecan pellets. A handful here. And I know the recipe calls for four pellets. That's some pretty specific stuff. I'm more of a salt and pepper chef, and some of these are cracked. So maybe y'all give me a thumbs up. I think that's around four pellets, whole pellets. More than anything, I think with food, you can ad lib a little bit. And what we're doing is we're just trying to get the smoke from the rosemary and the pecan to coat the interior of our rock glasses. So we're gonna lay our wet rosemary on the pellets just like that. We're gonna take our handy dandy blowtorch. I'm just using the back of a cast iron. our torch going and we're gonna light these pellets and rosemary we're gonna light them up get them smoking and fired turn this down just a little bit there we go and once those pellets have started to cherry up and get nice and rosy what we're gonna do is we're gonna capture their scent we're gonna capture their smoke we're gonna capture all those burning sugars that are being released from that wood and the rosemary. We'll get the next one. We're gonna throw our glass on it just like that. And right now that glass is starting to smoke inside. It's starting to get all that smoke just kind of waft in the interior. What a fun thing to do to a cocktail. I'm all for this. We do our next one just like that. All right, so now while that gets ready to do its thing, we're gonna need to crack an egg. Seem to have used up my bowl. All, eggs come in all different shapes and sizes, and I always think it's kind of interesting when you see a, a recipe that says one egg, large, medium, or small. Well, these are from my chickens, and as you can see, we've got small, medium, and large. So I'm gonna go with the large egg. Oh man, a double yoker. Dang. So what we're gonna do, because that yolk split into the egg white, 
that egg white won't froth properly because the fat from the yolk is now mixed with the white. So I'm gonna ditch this, I'm gonna start over. It's so important that when you're using just egg whites, whether it's whipping meringue, or making a pavlova, whether you're folding it into a cocktail like this, that we don't have that fat in there present, okay? Here we go, let's try this again. Oh my goodness, we had another cracked egg. I wonder if, because these have been sitting outside right now, and it's nice and hot out here. So we're gonna try one more. Everybody at home, if you're watching, I want you to root, 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 root for me here. Root for this egg. Okay, we wanna crack this thing. No cracked yolk, we want just the white. Boom, we'll take that, beautiful. We wanna make sure there's no shell in there. I see a little guy. And I'm gonna take the yolk out, place it in this bowl I've got down here, and now save the yolk, because you can always use this for tomorrow's eggs. But what you really want is you want that white. So we've got our shaker. Into our shaker goes our white. Here we go. We're gonna add lemon juice. Mmm, that's an orange that looks like a lemon. Tricked me once. Here's our lemon. Okay. Get our squeezer. I wanna get all this lemon juice in here. go. I don't know, can you all see the smoke in these glasses? I just think it's magical. It's beautiful looking seeing that in there. Doing its thing. And I know no one out there is letting me forget about our fruit that's grilling. Should we give it a quick peek? I'll let them hang for another couple minutes. They're gonna be just fine. So we have our egg white in here. We have our lemon juice. We're gonna go with our smoked simple syrup, about one and a half tablespoons. I may just measure for the fun of it. Don't wanna overdo it. Don't want it too sweet. One, one and a half. Next up, we're gonna do our whistle pig rye. This calls for about three tablespoons. I mean, do we really want to measure this? I guess. Smells great. I'm just gonna give this a little dry stir, kind of get it moving. I'm gonna add some ice to this now. Give it a nice chilled shake. Lid firmly on. Now the thing is, with that egg white, it's really the protein in the egg white that is gonna foam and gonna froth and gonna create that head or that layer on top of your cocktail. So you can beat up your shaker, you can get after it. I've got a nice firm single finger on top of that. Last thing I want to do is waste my drink. And it's interesting, I had two glasses smoking here. There's only one of me. I guess, Isabel, I should have made you a cocktail. But I think this recipe is a serve one. That's what it feels like in here, but obviously you can double, triple, quadruple this sucker up. I've got friends, actually. I got friends that have a cocktail maker that I think serves, I mean, it's at least a half a gallon. It's just incredible. Did you ever use lemon zest in a cocktail? Look at that. Lemon zest in a cocktail? Absolutely. Give me a little silver Patron. Come on. Throw a couple 
ice cubes in here. Another shake. Let's see how this turned out. This is a take on a whiskey sour. I love that they're using rye whiskey. Love the old fashioned fun inclusion of an egg white. Beautiful frothy head on it. And the last note for all you cocktail makers out there is to just add a drip and a drab of the simple syrup, or sorry, of the Angostura bitters. And little goes a long way here, folks. So I just splash a little bit on and I'm gonna leave it right there on top for me, you, whoever you're making this cocktail for, to kind of get their lips into that and let it kind of stir itself. So I'm gonna leave it right on top. And heck, just for fun of it, I'm gonna take this smoky rosemary. I'm gonna lay it there. I think that looks absolutely gorgeous. Look at this one. I just want you to see, I don't know if you can see this cup, but the smoke that's still released out of here. How fun is that? Heck yeah, take it. Okay, so we've got a cocktail made. Why don't we check on plating our chicken, check on our stone fruits, and see how we finish this dish. How long is it when you let the chicken last? Typically, rule of thumb, if you're cooking a prime rib, if you're cooking a big old brisket or large, large cut of meat, we're talking, you know, inches deep and thick. You potentially could rest upwards of 20 minutes and have great results. We've been letting this chicken rest for, gosh, all of 35, 40 minutes now. I guess the benchmark, though, is to let... The benchmark is to let your chicken rest for maybe 10 minutes is about all you need to do. Look at that bird. So, when taking a bird apart, I'm gonna go with the legs first, just like this. And in my house, I really love serving poultry on the bone and most meats on the bone. I'm gonna take these legs and thighs off. I'm definitely gonna take these wings off and leave those whole. So I hope that anyone who's joining right now sticks around for the Q&A with Chad Ward afterwards. I really enjoy those. It's a chance to get together, talk, hang out. Look at that. What a beautiful chicken breast. Do you grill fruit often? I grill pineapple often because I love it with carnitas tacos. Maybe that's the next TKL. I hope for a DM from everybody. I'd love to know what you all want to see next on a Traeger Kitchen Live. So you can see I'm just taking the entire breast right off of the rib cage. I would highly recommend save that rib cage. Do not throw that away. Not only can you pick it apart and get a ton of good meat still off it, however, taking that whole cage, throw that in a quart of water, and boom, you have yourself a two-person chicken soup ready to go, and or freeze it, and when you amass enough, make a big chicken broth. That'll be a nice smoky chicken broth. So here we go. I'm gonna finish plating this up. I like, it. like I was saying, at my family, I like leaving pieces nice and whole. I can hear those fruits. They're saying, yo, we are ready. Come get us. We're on our way. And then with these chicken breasts, the reason I really like taking them off the cage is so that I can slice them quite a bit easier once they're off the carcass. Smells awesome. Dad, if you were here right now, I'll take a bite for you. So I grew up in emigrant Montana 
and there's a barbecue shack there called Follow Your Nose. And my dad's number one most cherished food in the world. I mean, he's a lobster fisherman by trade. You'd think it'd be lobster. It's chicken. I guess that's what happens when you grow up a lobster fisherman. All you want is something other than lobster. What other Montana seasonings would you recommend as poultry? Oh my gosh. The sweet seasoning and our jalapeno seasoning blend, if you like a little spice, is an absolute, absolute must. I'd also say that red chili blend that's in here, I love the red chili blend really with any citrus. It's just a beautiful pairing. Um, you don't always have to stick with lime. I, I'll do orange as well. I think orange, oregano, garlic, it's terrific. I might keep a few for the chef. What's your absolute favorite dish of all time? Oh, come on, who's asking me that question? You can't ask a chef what their absolute favorite dishes of all time. But if I had to go there, I mean, naturally, it's gonna be a dish that is rich in story. So if I hunted it, if I fished it, if I caught it, if I farmed it, if you farmed it. So it's food that I know where it came from. I know what it's about. That's my favorite dish and or cooked over wood smoke is my all time favorite foods to cook. weirdest food I've ever prepared? Oh, come on. How do you ask a guy that? I'm just flipping my cutting board because so I was just cutting the meat on it. Now we have a nice clean surface here. It's a little chef hack. Oh, hey there. Look at these fruits. And our chicken looks really good. It's at 133 right now, so that one's not ready to come off yet, but it will be by the end of this. So I'm gonna take our grilled fruits. They look tremendous. Now, when working on this recipe, I work with a team and we talk about food, we geek out about food all the time. And so this dish, give me a second. I'm gonna get a few things going here. Oh, I found my dog. I wish I could take that camera. She's sitting right here. She's just waiting for a chunk of this to fall down. So originally, this dish, this dish is grilled stone fruits, apricot, nectarine, peach. They're grilled. They have a balsamic orange reduction, which we have here. And the way that this dish on the Traeger website, and you gotta go check it out because it's a winner. The way it works is you have your fruits, you have your whipped cream, and you drizzle it with a little balsamic. Well, we're gonna take a couple of these for purposes of our chicken dish first. So we have, let's see, a peach, a peach, a nectarine. I'm gonna leave those right there. What I'm gonna do for plating this up is I'm gonna think about, okay, if I'm a diner, if you're serving this to your friends or your family, you think about, okay, that one drum is a piece. Instead of giving them this whole half of a nectarine, I'm gonna cut this into thirds. Just like that. But what I was getting at was that when we were designing this recipe and playing with it, we, all, we agreed, and I had to be convinced of it though, that as the recipe originally calls for berries and cream, because dessert, that the berries were still a completely terrific add-on that we should keep a part of the dish, and I had to be convinced of it. So this is yours truly about to be convinced, because I got my little plate here, so I'm gonna take a bite. I've got a white grilled peach, I'm going to throw a couple of these fresh raspberries on there because that is the jam. A couple blueberries. And then again with this whole dish, 
We're just gonna finish it with some of these fresh berries. So think about it, you've got that chili, you've got the lime, you've got the fresh acids and sweetness of the berries. And then I think this real kicker is, is that pairing of that hickory smoke that's gonna be all over the fruit, it's gonna be all over the chicken. And then we're drizzling it with this balsamic reduction. And the recipe is, I did this ahead of time. I did this ahead of time, but the balsamic reduction is really just taking balsamic and honey, turning it on low heat, turning it on low heat, and letting it reduce down. You'd be careful not to burn it. But we're gonna take this beautiful reduction, nice and syrupy, just like that. And we're gonna finish a chicken dish. Last question. Oh, come on, let's go with the last question. Good timing. Who inspired you to cook? Hmm. Well, who inspired me to cook? Mother Nature? And flies are expensive. Listen, I was getting into fly fishing in high school and I wanted a car so that I could fish the rivers and streams of Montana and there was nobody just giving me cash. So I got a job flipping burgers and throwing pizzas at Chico Hot Springs. And I guess as they say, the rest is history. But I've been inspired by many chefs since then. But right out of the gate, it was out of necessity. I wanted a job. I wanted to be purposeful and I wanted to buy some gear to go play in the outdoors. Okay. So this is that finished dessert dish. It's gonna have your balsamic drizzled in it, just like that. That looks lovely. So that's that dessert dish. The Spatchcocked smoked chili and lime chicken looks gorgeous. I think it's time for yours truly to take a bite. Hold up. There we go. Let's see how she turned out with blueberry, with raspberry, and with the smoked peach all in a bite. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, flavors are beautiful. That's terrific. I think you all need to try this recipe. I'd say that white peach was probably on for a minute or so longer than I want it to be. Again, I want that fresh bite coming in there, but the flavors of the smoked bird plus the fruit, plus the fruit are really very, very, very good. We're gonna get after this again. Mm-hmm. So, to knock it off, let's see how this tried out. This is just sitting here hanging. Mm. Whistle pig rye, thank you all for doing a terrific rye. That's lovely. And hey, to each and every one of you that hung out for the last hour on this Traeger Kitchen Live, thank you for joining me, Chef Eduardo Garcia, with my company, Montana Mex, in this celebration of food from my heart to yours. I hope I hear from you on Instagram. I'm at Chef Eduardo Garcia. Ask me some questions. Let me know how you're doing. If you try this dish out, I want to hear about it. I want to see pictures. So tag Traeger, tag Montana Max, tag me. Let us know what you're cooking. And I think in 15 minutes from now, join us on Traeger's Instagram. We're going to go live and we're going to do a question and answer with Whiskey Bent Barbecue, AKA Chad Ward. So much love from me to you. We'll see you all soon. Bye-bye.